Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live June 26, 2019. The last one. We're going to be talking about uh, should you spend $20,000 on a photography June degree or should. Oh boy, I don't even know how to one. make this We're one. We're going to be talking quiet. about uh, should you spend $20,000 on. Oh, this newfangled technology. <laughs> <laughs> and that is our go. show. That's that sums up our show. Uh, I got no idea what I'm doing, but no, this is a weekly show where I'm joined by my good friend and co-host Steve Skirt. Steve, how are you? I'm great. Uh, did you get a haircut? I did get a haircut. A few of them. Biffy. A few Thank of you. them. Like you know, you know that dad oh, joke. A few of the hairs were cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or a Steve joke, I should call it. I feel like that's I was gonna say, man. Just for the record, I didn't say that. That was a. Uh... <laughs> That sounds like something I would have said to you, though. <laughs> yep. And we should welcome and apologize to as uh, the chat room. Thank you for joining us on this uh, Wednesday afternoon. Or if you're not watching live, wherever it is, whenever it is, wherever you are. Uh, as I started to tease at the beginning, we've got a couple of cool topics in the show. One, would you spend $20,000 on a degree or a pile of photography gear? I'm going to be talking about summer road trips. I'm taking one with my family, and Steve and I are taking one a little bit later this summer together. Uh, we're going to talk about gadgets for road trips, and of course, uh, all of the week's photography news and sharing your Lightroom, your video, your photos in Lightroom, and sharing some tips and tricks about those. Sounds yeah. awesome. It does sound pretty good. Yeah. Um, and I teased the title, last one, just up front, because of summer commitments and travels, uh, it will be a while before this show returns at its regularly scheduled time. It may be late August. Just wanted to break that news to you now. I'm sorry, chat room. I want to see lots of sad emojis to make us feel loved. Or just hit the thumbs up button. Either way works because you're like, thank God, I don't feel like I have to go watch those guys and hold their hand. <laughs> yeah yeah that's um that's crazy and and actually came into the show i didn't even think about our future schedule i, I usually just kind of think okay every wednesday is mishmash and but you start to look at tours and your schedule and my schedule and we've done fewer tours together this year um and just as a result and kind of you know me severely cutting back on tours but you've you've cut back a little bit and kind of done some of your own things as well um so when you start looking at our schedules together you're like man this summer uh anyway i'm looking mm -hmm. forward to our road trip though that's going to be a lot of fun yep. uh, for those who don't know we're we're actually toby and i are leading our first tour together with the blessing of uh, david and ally mckay and i'm actually quite flattered and very excited about this trip coming up we're doing an alaska grizzly um boat tour and it's actually the second tour. Dave and Allie are leading the first, and then Toby and I are flying in, and we're doing the second one. Um, that's going to be just a lot of fun. And then right after that, we hook up with uh, Frank and Miriam Stelgus up in Alaska, who some of you know from doing our Alaska tours. And we're going to do a road trip, a uh, boys road trip, all the way to northern Alaska. Pretty much, I think, as far as you can go, right? That's right. We uh, The plan is to drive as far north as you can physically drive on this continent. That's awesome. That is. I'm really excited about that. It's really cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, that should be a good time. You know, I, I made that announcement maybe a little hastily. I'm actually thinking, I don't know your schedule, Steve, but I think I'm around one month from now on a Wednesday and we'll do the show with or without you, Steve. But hopefully we'll see if we can fit you in there too. I think that's like June, July 23rd, I think. So it's, hold uh, on. That particular day, I probably can't because it's my wife's birthday and she could think of a few other things she'd rather have me doing with her than mishmash. Mm. Sorry, you guys, but uh, that's I understand. I understand. <laughs> but Renee, just so you know, first off, I didn't know that Chris's birthday is July 25th, just oh. two days later. Didn't know that. Um, and I am leading my Mount Rainier workshop over the course of her birthday. Psst. Oh, is she going with you? Well, I don't know. We haven't quite discussed that yet. I don't know if there's room. <laughs> 
<laughs> Way to go, pal. <laughs> look, I'm trying to make a living here. That Those dates looked good when I was planning them on the calendar that didn't have her birthday on it. And Well, you, know. <laughs> well, you got your permanent uh, goose partnership thing. That's, that's a little less serious than the... Uh, the marriage commitment that we're under. So I, you might be able to get away with it. I can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. All right. So let's dive into the show though. Uh, first up is where we share some stuff that we have produced over the past week, either on my channel or through Photo Enthusiast Network, which if you're watching this and you're not a Photo Enthusiast Network member, you should consider joining it as a fantastic resource to grow as a photographer. We have hundreds of hours of educational video each week in your inbox. You get a new tip. Sometimes that's a written, sometimes it's a bonus video. Sometimes it is just a fantastic content for your brain that makes you think. And as part of that thinking, you become a better photographer. You can learn more. The easiest URL to throw out is photorec.tv slash pen. But Roy has put together a link in the show notes and in the chat as well. So you can find it there. And just a reminder that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. I have made significant strides in moving my site over. I shared it last week. It doesn't visually look much different, but behind the scenes, there was a couple more important pieces that had to happen. And, you know, here, true talk. So I was back and forth with their Squarespace support because I needed to know how to do X, Y, and Z. And uh, they have fantastic 24 seven support. But then they kind of wrote back and were like, well, no, you can't do X and Y, but you could do Z. And I was like, oh, I, I think you're wrong, actually. And then I thought I was going to have to come tell you all that they don't know what they're talking about. So I, I simply said, I think you're wrong because look at this help page in this line here. They wrote back very short while later and not only said, I'm so sorry, you're absolutely right, but we've put our heads together with our team and here's exactly what you need to do. So yes, they're not perfect, but I really love the way they handled that and gave me exactly what I needed. So I've been very, very happy as I, if you're watching this for the first time, uh, Squarespace has been a sponsor of this show for, for many years, um, but I'm now actually moving my website from WordPress to Squarespace because I'm tired of all of the broken bits that I've had to deal with over the last couple of years and security issues. And I just don't foresee any of that being an issue at Squarespace because they manage all of it together, one platform, one place to go, one place to go if you need help. So you can save 10% off your first purchase at squarespace.com slash photorec TV. That's awesome, man. And that's no small thing, the way a company handles a question that you have, even if they're, you know, I mean, they're probably telling you what they think is correct and mm -hmm. you proved them wrong, but, um, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but we've done some business with other website companies. And unfortunately, we don't get that kind of transparency or honesty or feedback. Or, and uh, that's that's yeah. refreshing. So yeah. I was pretty happy to see that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so real quick, uh, new content on pen. Uh, I put out a Tuesday tip yesterday about lens correction, automatically doing that on import. Sometimes that can have a drastic effect on the look of your image. You want it to automatically look at what lens you use, what focal length you used, if it was not a prime lens to figure out the best distortion correction. It's got a little database of all of that information and apply that automatically so that you don't forget to do it later. And then I sent along with that Tuesday tip, two presets, one that does that plus some very basic edits and another one that I've just started using using with the auto checked. I have to say the very latest version of Lightroom, that auto settings checkbox jump starts you in 99% of the way at cases I've used so far to a very good starting point, then you put your finishing touches on it. But I've been pleased with that so far. So you might want to try that on import. Let Lightroom do the heavy lifting. Well, I should say let Lightroom do kind of the beginning lifting and then you finish off any of those pieces that are fine art. That's uh, I'm, I'm not surprised by the auto check because I don't do that. Um, but I have noticed that all the sliders in the develop panel from basically from exposure down through uh, what's at the bottom, the, you know, saturation and vibrance, vibrance and saturation. Um, you can hold down your shift key and double click on the slider and it takes it to where the auto setting for that particular slider should be. 
And I've kind of started using that as my starting point with that particular slider. And it's just become almost a habit now when I edit my photos as I go down through the sliders and just have my finger on the shift key and I'm double clicking. And then if I like what I see, I kind of just leave it alone. And more, more often than not on certain sliders, I make some tweaks myself, but I kind of just at least get that auto set and then I move it from there. And, and a hundred percent of the time I make my own uh, adjustments to it, but I probably should do what you're talking about is just start with the auto on import and then it'll save me a little bit of time because I'm kind of just doing it anyway now. And they have yeah, uh, yep. done a really nice job of, of figuring a lot of that stuff out. Yeah. I do like that you pointed out though, that you can do this individually holding down shift and double clicking. I think that's a great way to go as well. Um, and be warned though, folks, if you have a slightly older version of Lightroom, it didn't work nearly as good. It is yeah. really just this very last version where yeah. I find myself agreeing with the edits it makes most of the time. Yeah, good point. So keep 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 that in mind. So I do that. And then uh, a video by David that went out this week in the Photo Enthusiast Network is Same Scene 2, what is it called? Two Picks. And it basically talks about, you know, taking the scene in front of you and finding within it multiple images, which so often you can easily, easily do. And it's just nice to see again from that professional photographer's artistic eye, what to look for to kind of divide up a scene. Well, and I encourage everybody to watch it because quite frankly, we've entered a whole new realm now. That quick bite video that David did, get this, with intro is one minute and 27 seconds. <laughs> Has that man ever been that short and succinct? No. No. And even he got it, he was able to thank people for being members and everything. Like <laughs> the intro, what he had to teach, and it's a great video. I, I'm actually I don't mean to water that down at all because it it really just shows you, you know, one one scene and then the two images you can get out of it are vastly different. So it's definitely worth worth watching. But it's a minute and twenty-seven seconds. Everybody's got a minute and 27 seconds that they can dedicate to watching a video to make yourself a better photographer and just plant one thing in your head for the next time you're out shooting. So uh, I just never thought I would ever see a David video be less than two minutes and he crushed it. <laughs> so it, I don't think I can make a video under two minutes. I get pretty, pretty wordy. And uh, I've, I've made um, sometimes when I make videos, I'll have like seven different cuts and I'm like, forget it. I'm just going with my 10 minute video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's funny. You know, I've, I've made a few videos and they always end up a bit longer than I expect. And then I always find bits I can trim out. So he's done, he's done a really nice job with that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, I haven't had anything out on my channel, uh, but tomorrow is an interesting look at geotagging and I'll give you a little spoiler, talk a little bit more about this watch and how nice it is for geotagging and a new app I found that I'm really excited about using on the road trip. So we'll tease that a little bit more. Well, I just teased it. We'll talk about the road trip a little bit more, um, but watch that video tomorrow. It'll be out on my channel to learn more about an app that's really good for kind of showcasing your pictures and the path you took to get there tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and a reminder that the July photo uh, PPA level image competition is open. Of course, you can submit at pen.community slash review. Don't forget that. That is where you can win fantastic prizes from Bay Photo. And even if you don't win, you get invaluable feedback from David, Allie, and Steve. Um, review your images. And uh, it's just a fantastic way to grow as a photographer. It's one of the many ways that you can grow as a photographer if you are a pen member, if you yeah, take advantage uh, of what we offer. That's a great reminder. I know it's early in the game. The deadline for June was just yesterday, but uh, we are going to be out of town. We're going to be in Mongolia. I don't suspect that we're going to be very active online. So let this serve as a reminder to, you know, please start working on those images and get those in before the deadline. Um, and just so you guys know, for you pen members that, that do watch the image review videos that come out, we talked about this at, at the end of uh, last month's review, but the June video is actually going to be released a little bit later than usual. Uh, because of our travel just taken off July 2nd basically is when I leave and we don't get back until um, I, don't know, I think mid July so uh, we'll, we'll get the image review recorded as soon as we get back but we certainly won't be doing it out in the desert of Mongolia as far as I know 
Sounds good. All right, we're going to dive into our part of the show, Steve, where we uh, critique a few photos in Lightroom and give you some tips and tricks. So uh, let me make sure everybody can see my, I, I tried to do that so smoothly, had it all queued up, but now I realize that I need to, oh yeah, no, we're ready to go. Okay, good. You can see the screen? I can. Awesome. All right. So this is one of our favorite parts of the show where you pen members have submitted to us some images that you want some both feedback on and getting some tips and tricks inside Lightroom for, for making them a little bit better. We talk a lot about um, kind of some of these tools in Lightroom. It's nice to spend a few moments showing them off. And we're going to start with Chris Bartell. She submitted this a few weeks ago and uh, we had to cut it for time. But I want to get back to it because I uh, really, really like this image. That's awesome. Yep. She's man, she's been killing it lately. She has produced some fantastic work and I and we we talk about this probably each week. We bring up some photographer's name that's a member of ours. And it's not necessarily because they're a member, but it's because we we see their work more often, we interact with them more often and we just see this growth that is awesome. And I think we should take some credit uh, or photo enthusiast network should take some credit. I'm not saying it's all the credit. You still have to get out there and actually take the photos and Chris is doing that. It's awesome. Yeah, and I, I'm um, a big fan of the way she's processing her images too. They're 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 very realistic. She has a good eye. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, she had that portrait. I think it was last week or the week before, uh, where she did the background. Remember, it was the the Indian guy that had the all the feathers and stuff. Or yep. it was just it was so cool. Um, so you can see the amount of work that she's putting in, and she's really improving. It's it's just great to see. No, very nice. So, uh, first thing I want to talk to you about, Steve, is would oh she this is cropped already. Look at that. So, uh, uh, Chris has sent us a DNG that's holding her edits, which I we do like. It's not mandatory, but it is lovely to see what you've done with the image. And uh, you've already cropped it down some. You're working with a seven R Mark II, though. You have a lot of megapixels, so there's still plenty here. Uh, would you go ahead and come in? Uh, it changes a lot, doesn't it? You know what, Toby? Um, do me a favor. Go back, go back up like you did, cropping out the bottom flower, and then take it on the left side and go all the way to the edge, to the left edge. All right, and then yeah, go up a little bit, kind of put that flower in the lower right third. Uh huh. And then I would go into Photoshop and kind of eliminate some of the yellow stuff in the background and just it, it gives that one flower in isolation, I think looks absolutely beautiful. Just just another way to go, Chris, if you're watching this. Yep. Composition. Yep. I think that's really nice. I'm curious if we move texture to the right. I've been using texture more and more and finding that it's very smart. Um, I didn't mention that I had a fantastic workshop, a uh, Lightroom workshop in Sacramento this weekend. And it just, it's, it's fun to, to teach a program. I mean, it is mostly fun to teach a program that changes from time to time because then it means you have to kind of constantly update and talk about what has changed. And texture, we talk about this, Steve, your little analogy of salt on food. I feel like texture is a very healthy salt, you know, um, yeah. because it seems like you can be more heavy handed uh, without it, um, you know, overdoing the image, overcooking or over adding too much salt. Yeah, um, I would take highlights down a bit too. The the highlights at the top of the flower are are getting a little blown out in that white area at the very top. Or you can go in with a brush and kind of, you know, darken it down just a little bit. Yeah. Um, and you know, maybe even pump up some contrast a little bit. Now you have to imagine this picture without the yellow flowers in the background, which kind of you know blurred out. It just becomes visual debris. Yeah. So you, you want to take that out, and um, and also the the green leaves that are kind of sticking up right in the foreground, so that that one flower just really stands on its own. So uh, real quick, let's see if this works. I have switched over to a graduate a radial filter. It is uh, not inverted, so it's affecting everything outside this flower. I'm going to come down to the range mask and choose color. And then let's hit O to get rid of that. And let's come over here and kind of select that up there. And let's see if we can battle that back a little bit. Not so much. 
well, we can certainly wash it out a bit. I just was curious if yeah. we could do it without even going into Photoshop. So again, uh, this, this, I, I'm using this, finding myself using this on almost every picture, the range mask, either color or luminance that really allows fine control over what is being affected and what's not. Um, but I simply selected the yellow, told the mask to conform to that now. So you can see, let's do shift O to a different color, uh, the white. So now you can see what is being affected, just those more yellowish areas outside the circle and then desaturated them a little bit. Could also bring clarity down. And then Toby, if you're using that same radial filter, um, mm -hmm. really darkening around it, I think would be kind of nice too. It, it obviously still keep the uh, the texture and, and being able to see the leaves and stuff, but um, almost like applying a thick vignette all the way around would look really cool. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if you can if you can do it with those uh, color changes that you made. You may have to just duplicate the filter. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I did. So I duplicated the filter and then just further reducing that some. Oh, I think that looks nice, Steve. Let's bring it in a little bit tighter. Yeah, and, and uh, I'd, it may be even a bit darker than that. Yeah. That's oh, too much, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, because uh, what, what we've kind of created here is we've almost created like an artificial studio lighting, right? That's been applied just to the flower right there. Or if the sun was to be peeking through and mm -hmm. just actually right on that flower. Yep. Yeah. Very nice. Nice job, Chris. Uh, really beautiful picture. And I, I just love that, uh, Steve, you went in a totally different direction with the composition. Nice. All right, we're going to pop over to Melanie, who very nicely, as part of the title, put suggestions on crop, please. Hmm. Ah. Good question, Mel. So, again. I'm assuming this is the Melanie uh, from our tours. Yes, this is the Melanie from okay. our tours. And was like, just I was call her Mel. If it was some uh, new person, they're like, what? He doesn't even know me. He's calling me Mel. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, we can see that Melanie went with a uh, very uh, kind of panorama, uh, almost a 16 by 9, I think, maybe even a little bit wider than that. Oh, yeah, it was, definitely was. Was it closer to a 2 by 1? Oh, now I messed it up. That's the one thing Lightroom does is that I don't like is when you change the aspect ratio, it shrinks it in further than it needs to, even on the top and bottom. But, okay, she had something like that. I could also undo. So I want to try something crazy. And this is, is uh, maybe I'm just in one of these moods today. Yeah. Um, kind of going to be as crazy as what I did to Chris's photo. So if you guys are, are taking offense to what I'm doing with your uh, composition, I, I deeply apologize. None, none is intended. Um, I'd like to see a vertical crop, Toby. Hmm. And I'd like to see the sun at the very top third or even quarter and you know some foreground and then go as wide out on the left side to the rock edge to that big rock that that thing is competing with the sunlight so much it's it's totally cool looking but it's it's a visual competition and um it, yeah i would i would keep it more vertical okay like a yeah four five sort of ratio mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something like that i just mm -hmm. i don't know if the foreground is cool enough but maybe when we look at it that way, there's some things that we could kind of work on. Yeah, I think it's a really neat idea, Steve. And, you know, I think this is something that a lot of people step up to a scene. And I talk about, we, we talk about lots, using that rule of thirds, having that on in your camera and trying to decide, should there be more sky as the thirds or should there be more landscape? And the question is, where's, where's the most interesting stuff? And yeah. I think what you've chosen here, Steve, is, is great because there's not, what's going on up here? Yeah, that's that's what kind of led me to to try this out. Yeah, yeah. So now let's see if we can get the the landscape looking a little bit more interesting. Uh, shadows have already been brought up a good bit, so let's see if we get a graduated filter. Looks like you used some already. That's on the sky, and this one is on the landscape. Ah, uh, but you're using a luminance mask. You're brightening just the brighter part of the image. Let's just. Um, I don't know if we need that mask in this case. I want the whole image to get a little bit brighter, uh, the whole lower part. And I also want to warm it up to match the kind of warm tones in the sky. Yeah. And um, yeah. gosh, you can bring down, um, you know, bring down some highlights and maybe even darken some shadows just a little bit for a little bit of contrast pop. 
And uh, I don't know, the texture slider might be good here. Also, a little bit of dehazing could, mm -hmm. could be nice. Now, why do you think dehazing might be nice, Steve? There is well, no real haze here. You have a lot of similar tones in the, in the rock. You have this kind of light colored tan that is uh, different shades. And when it's all together, it just looks a little hazy. Not that there is haze, it's just a lot of the same tones together create almost this foggy look, this hazy look. And when you dehaze it a little bit, you start to see more detail and differences in the color tones. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a nice choice. Uh, I'm down here in the HSL panel. I'm gonna just sh uh, shift the green to a little bit more green to see if we can make some of that pop. I don't want, some of that got a little too yellow as I warmed it up back there. So, um, and then we might bring up the saturation in the green a little bit. Um, but I think this is this is pretty nice. I would, uh, personally, I'd go a little little extreme. This is an extreme scene, so mm -hmm. I'd go a little extreme with a uh, graduated filter up in the sky. I know she's already done one. We can leave those alone, but put, we could put a new one in there. Uh, and yeah, I mean, back the blue off a little bit, but I like that that gradual kind of blue into the mm -hmm. into the. Uh, the yellow and the orange. And I don't know if you bring up the red tint just a little bit, it'll give it sort of a purpley tone. Uh, you know, that, that might be a little, little heavy handed. I don't know. I think that looks pretty good. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And, and now you've got a differentiation from uh, kind of the cooler tones at the very top, getting into the warmer tones in, in the middle and to the bottom. So I, I like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's nice. Uh, and then the only thing I would do, Melanie, is probably a little Photoshop work, kind of get this bush out of there. Just being yeah. cut off, it, it cuts, but we got all of that one is, is pretty nice. Um, and you could also take a brush and you could paint a little green tint on some of these off here in the distance if you wanted those. But they look uh, they look like they're being nicely lit by the setting sun, which uh, is what's going on. So I think that would work pretty well. So curious what you do with that bush or that brush. A little bit brighter, more exposure. Yeah, nice. All right, and then Kevin Walk spent the day at a track, and so we've been seeing some nice shots, a lot of good panning shots, Kevin. Yeah. Um, really like that. It gives a sense of speed, motion, um, and uh, you've been nailing a lot of these. We look this. Uh, panning this shots are hard, man. They're really, really. Uh, they're they're impactful when you see them. They're really cool, but to totally nail the focus of your subject is a that's that's a tough thing to do. Well, it's like shooting yep. wild. You know, it's hard to get yep. them in super clear. Yeah, and a, a nice, you know, uh, leading into the frame with room in front, so we can feel like it's moving. If you had shot it at this edge of the frame, I think uh, it would feel a little bit more tensiony. I, I don't know if I have any real um, heavy edits to suggest on this. Maybe a little more contrast, Steve. Anything from you? Yeah, I mean, I, I may do a radial filter around the car and uh, kind of darken the background down a bit and also reduce saturation. So uh, you're going to reduce the green, some of the different color tones that are around the car. So the car is just going to really stick out as the only, you know, brighter. It already does, but you've got some green in the background. I would kind of tone that down a little bit and darken it so that the car just really pops off the page. Um, you know, but it's, you know, Kev, you did a great job with the shot. The panning is good. Um, the composition is great. That's a strong place to put it. You've left room in the direction that the car is traveling. So visually, it doesn't look like the car is just going to hit the edge of the frame. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just made those edits. They starting to feel a little heavy, but it's really neat is how easy it is. Just bump the feathering up because let's let's go to zero for a second. There is our change from inside to outside the filter. And uh, I feel like you can kind of see a little bit of glow around the car until you get up above 50, the default setting. And yeah, just fades it I, out really nice. What I really like about that, too, is it's darkened the asphalt just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think the way it came in, the asphalt was it was just a little washed out for me. I wanted to see the road be darker and, and uh, some differentiation between the asphalt and that retaining wall in the back. Yeah. And then I just quickly right clicked 
and inverted and now I'm going the other direction, texture clarity and a little saturation to just further kind of enhance the inter inside to outside. And this I probably would feather even a little bit more because you really don't want that bleeding off the edges at all. There you go, nice sharp car. Good job, Kev. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you to those folks who submitted images. If you would like to have images submitted to us in the future, um, then uh, just join Penn. And there is a link posted each week, a day or two before the show that reminds you, but that link stays the same. You could bookmark it. You could bookmark it and put it on your calendar so that it automatically popped up. Wouldn't that be smart? And reminded you because there is lots of different ways to grow as a photographer, but one of them is to get some feedback on your work by some people that have some experience, not a ton, just some. <laughs> not a ton. We always say, I know a lot of you have heard us talk about this before, but if anybody's uh, tuning in and, and you haven't watched this before, or haven't heard us say this, getting feedback from people that are close to you, like your family and friends and stuff, it's all, it's all great. And there can be a lot of good constructive criticism that can come out of that. But most of the time, it's like eating candy. It tastes really good. It's a lot of fun. It makes you feel good. Um, but there's not a whole lot of nutritional value to it in many cases. So, you know, with the Photo Enthusiast Network and having access to four professional photographers that are all very different in our fields of expertise and what we do for a living and uh, kind of being able to put our heads together from time to time and help you guys grow as photographers. We hope that we're providing um, more nutrition, you know, more nutritional meal that really is gonna help you grow. And sometimes that's a little painful. We certainly never mean to be uh, cruel or anything like that. In fact, the big reason we started Penn was to avoid that kind of thing uh, out there on the internet. But um, I know that, you know, there's I, I picked Toby's brain constantly on tour when i'm working on a photo i'll show it to him and say hey what do you think of this and he never turns to me and says dude that's so awesome you're the best photographer post it he's got some suggestion that makes sense and it makes the photo better and he does the same thing to me so we even do that amongst ourselves we like to we like to eat nutritional meals not just candy all the time candy's yummy <laughs> candy is yummy especially <laughs> yep. least, you know, butter uh, and chocolate yeah, uh, those, that's good. That is good candy. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, we'll, we'll have to hold on to that. I'd love to see chat. Uh, I want to know your favorite road trip snack or candy. Yes. Uh, yes. What's uh, yours? Uh, you know, um, Fig Newtons probably. I love oh, That's a good, I, you and I have road tripped with Fig Newtons many times, actually. Yep. That's a good one. Yeah, they're good. They feel somewhat healthy um, and they're just, they're just pretty good. I can, I can go through one of those little side packages pretty fast. So I, I'm like healthy. No, road trip, you get in the car and it's just, everything gets thrown out the way. Well, not really, but uh, <laughs> Reese, I, I'd say Reese's sticks. Mm -hmm. I love Reese's mm -hmm. Pamper. Those sticks are amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, peppered beef jerky mm -hmm. and uh, popcorn in a bottle of water. That's mm -hmm. that's my road trip. Mm -hmm. And then All many right. stops of Taco Bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or Del Taco for their Beyond Meat. Did you guys see my Instagram stories? It was it was I quite good. That. It was it quite made, good. Made me want to go to another steakhouse. <laughs> just just to offset my carbon footprint offsetting <laughs> i wrote to toby i said man you just reminded me i had the best steak for dinner last night <laughs> sorry yep. sorry That's everybody <laughs> uh, most people like steak um yeah but chat room i want to see yours um a treat like the uh, reese's pieces uh, is good from time to time and uh yeah yeah we'll see we'll see how this road trip goes this summer and keeping the kids happy with my 12 year old who's gotten pickier about food and also grumpier about having to go on this trip for the most part so it could be a little bit of a slog <laughs> <laughs> we'll see all right about this one yeah, but let's talk about the fun part of the road trip, the amount of gadgets and gear I'm bringing. And we're going to dive into our news, but one of them I can relate right back to what I got on the table or about to, and that is iPad OS. The betas are out, or a beta is out. It's being updated fairly uh, uh, constantly. But it is coming this fall, and it promises to make these iPad devices 
um, much, much more computer-like. Can you see how dirty that is? Um, so uh, what are some of the changes, Steve? Do you know them off the top of your head? Um, well, first of all, did you sneeze on that thing or something? What? <laughs> let me, let me get my, where's, where's my lens cleaning cloth? Let me, uh, let me get it over here for a second. Just kind of don't look. Look away. Look away. This is the Bush League show we got going on here. Well, how, okay. Uh, well, honestly, though, first up, how do you keep your iPad screen nice and clean? Are you constantly wiping? Well, I, first of all, I sneeze into my armpit. <laughs> I don't sneeze onto the screen. Um, no, I actually, that's, it's kind of funny you say that. I pretty much have a microfiber cloth in my pocket all the time when I'm, you know, out shooting or using electronics or traveling or whatever. And I just kind of wipe it down a lot. Um, I've got a million, like all over the place are microfiber cloths. I just live with them near me because everything we look at oh. is these days. Oh, I did. I found one within reach. Huh. Yeah. See, there you go. And oh, those of you that have toured with us before the McKay microfiber cloths are outstanding quality because some of them really aren't very good. Those are, those are good. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what do I know about iPad OS? I honestly, I don't really know too much. And had you asked me that question a few weeks ago, right after the Apple keynote at, uh, I think it was the developers conference, I probably could have told you more because I watch all that stuff and I retain it for about a day and a half. And now I've forgotten a lot of it. One of the big things though that I'm excited about with iPad OS is the ability to now be able to hook up an external drive and move files back and forth because that's always been a bit of the crux in me being able to use mine as a device out in the field. You know, I could get my photos onto it and it was it was a little cumbersome, but okay, I could deal with that. But then I couldn't move things over to another drive. And so what would happen is I would run out of space on my iPad unless I was actually um, sorting through and calling my photos out in the field. What I wanted to do was get them on there be able to do a little bit of editing and then dump a bunch of files just onto an external drive so that I can free up space on the iPad and keep using that as my travel device. So I think that iPad OS will finally be the answer to that problem. Yes, that's that's what I'm hearing as well. That'll be nice. Um, and that that right there is, is huge, as you're saying. Um, the other is that kind of uh, more desktop-like experience where you can have yeah. multiple windows open, move bits around. Um, you also have that, I can't remember the fancy name for it, but where this can now act like a second screen and or a Wacom tablet to that, your oh, main. That's right. I forgot about That's going to be yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I love using the Apple Pencil on iPad. I just haven't done much editing on it. And I always envision that being kind of the future of how I'd like to edit photos. And just never got into the Wacom thing for one reason or another. Um, I could totally get into using that as a tablet on my desktop computer or uh, out in the field. And it's also, I think, you know, it's going to enable a lot of the apps to be much more desktop-like. Hopefully with Adobe, we don't have, you know, this, this stripped-down sort of CC version now. We're getting more into full function of uh, classic style app for editing. I know Photoshop has a full Photoshop that they're rolling out for iPad. And it's it's uh, pretty exciting times. Uh, quite honestly, this is the kind of stuff that should have happened about four or five years ago on iPad. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, let, uh, real quick, I'm just curious what ha happens now. So um, I want to plug in this external SSD. I have this little doodad because right now you only have a USB-C on these newer ones, but it adds a bunch of other ports, uh, including an SD card reader, micro SD, full USB, a headphone jack, and an HDMI out. That's kind of snazzy. Um, and that's a little, I think it's from Belkin. So let's just see, is it just going to completely ignore this little drive? I was happy with how easy it was to get pictures in, even in its current state. Um, I think it tells you it doesn't have enough power to support that device or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it doesn't, nothing, doesn't nothing. even show up. No. Nope. Okay. I've, yeah. I've had mine before say something like, iPad uh, cannot support this device for something. Technical that I didn't uh, totally understand. Yeah, and it makes it makes sense. Let me try another one. This is uh, these are on the one terabyte version of these uh, is on sale still. Uh, I think it's 
Oh, I can't remember what the price was. It's something fairly reasonable on B&H though. And we also, that reminds me, B&H is the deal on the one terabyte other drives for just $39. or the older traditional spinning hard drives that you want to be a little more careful and banging around. But one terabyte for 40 bucks is not bad. Yeah, nothing happens at all. Nothing oh, oh, no, no, no. It's acting like it's a camera and it wants to import photos. Okay. So, yeah, not, so not really okay. Useful. You could probably, if you could get images on there, then you could pull them in. But yeah, uh, we, we want to go the other way. Right. So, I really, um, I'm hearing that the beta is fairly buggy, but I am, you know, this isn't my iPad. This is on loan to me to review. Uh, and well, I think I just need to try out that, 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 um, the new software. But again, very easy to get stuff in now. Um, very easy to bring it up in the Lightroom mobile version on here and start editing. I was impressed with just how easy and powerful this all works. It's pretty nice. I'm using the Logitech uh, keyboard. It's the little kind of Bluetooth connection. It's a little heavy and, and thick, uh, but I love that it has a full keyboard. I've hear, I'm hearing better things about it than the Apple. That's why I'm testing this version out. And then there's the pencil, um, which I didn't even actually use in the editing. I just used my finger. That's why the screen's a little dirty because, you know, <laughs> my finger's a little greasy apparently. So um, I, I guess I could click the article and then remind ourselves what else exactly. I think we hit on the main points though of what this iPad OS will provide for us. Um, the folder, um, USB external drive support, files app and iPad local storage opened up for more. Additional keyboard shortcuts, uh, mouse support. Oh, mouse support, yep. Uh, and support for connections to networked servers. Oh, and that also reminds me, you know, one of the things that I really like, and I know, I know this has been iOS enabled at least probably for about a year, is being able to put different keyboards on here. I love the Swift key keyboard on Android. And so to be able to pop that same keyboard on here, have it make the same predictions. It knows me. I've let it read my email and my text messages. So it's suggesting, you know, Nikon and Canon and Sony words left and right for me, which is very nice. So that right there is, is just something that I think Apple has done smartly in the last year or two to open up the ecosystem a little bit more. I've always given them a little crap for being such a walled garden. And now that they're a little less walled garden, I think the, the devices become that much more useful. Yeah, and I know the the big thing that a lot of people talk about too with iOS 13 and now, uh, uh, oh, what is it? iPad OS. iPad OS, yeah. Uh, dark mode will be available too. A lot of people uh, yeah. And, and I am one of the people that's excited. I use dark mode on my, on my iMac at home all the time. I use it on my laptop. I, I love it. And especially on mobile devices, I really like it because it's not so so bright. And then it also helps uh, save battery life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm interested to see battery life too about this. One thing I noticed is that I can charge my camera over the USB-C cord. I don't think that's great for this, this battery um, life, but that was interesting that you can do that after you finish importing, you turn the camera off and it does just start charging. Um, I'm clearly, we. Uh, this is a recurring theme too. We are clearly constantly talking about how can we travel a little lighter? How can we do our job on the road while still having a device with us that allows us to do that? And and on the road trip this summer, this might be the only computing device besides my phone I bring. It might be. But as a backup, I am testing out a mid-range 13-inch iMac Pro. Um, hey, there's everybody chatting right there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've been holding on to, this is my own laptop right here, 15-inch, two, late 2000, or no, mid-2014 model, five years old. It's still no, going strong. I think, I think you have the same one as me. We're late 13, right? The 15 inch retina, late, late 2013. Oh, you're right. You're right. Late 2013. Same laptop. Because that and that combo that you have right there, that's the migration that I really want to do. I want to go from mine, which is just like yours, to that 13 inch, either the mid range MacBook Pro or, you know, I'd love to just do the MacBook or even the MacBook Air. Just because it's smaller and lighter, and I don't, I don't need a heavy lifting computing power while I'm out on the road. A lightweight that I can use, and then, you know, kind of shelve it while I'm at home and working on my desktop. Yeah, yeah. But they're yeah. expensive machines, uh, and I, I don't want to ignore that. But I will say, I've said this many times on this show and everywhere else. You, 
I'm still using a, a laptop from 2013. And the only reason I want to get rid of it is because it's so heavy and big. Like that's, that's amazing to me from 2013. It works perfectly. It fires up. It's fast. It's got a retina screen. It's bright as ever. It's an amazing computer. It's in perfect condition. Um, you know, it's just, it's just aged in terms of weight and size for my lifestyle right now. But um, you pay more for Apple, but in my experience, I've, I've gotten a lot of life out of these things. I've, my desktop I just replaced in late 2017, my last one was from 2006 or seven. It's like 10 years. Yeah, I know, it's, pre it's pretty impressive. And you know, certainly this machine is faster, but in day-to-day -day use, it's not that much different. That's why I've kind of been holding off and upgrading. Um, <laughs> And again, in the exact same boat as you, Steve, this 15 inch, you know, I feel it's heavy, but it's doing, it's doing the job. It's doing the job. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. I That's drank right. water on the wrong pipe. Uh, Kate wants to say, how can you see images to process them on those small screens? That's true. Uh, you know, if I wouldn't process, you know, a, an image that I think is going to be a fine art piece or that I'm going to send off to a client, I want to see that on my 27 inch iMac at home. But for sharing on Instagram, for producing images to put out on the YouTube channel, for even editing short video clips, that smaller screen is just fine. You pinch the zoom very quickly. You're in at a high detail. The responsiveness, back to talking about the iPad mostly, is impressive. And then even on, on this screen, um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, uh, it, it's a great point. And your answer is spot on. That's exactly how I feel as well. I will say, though, that um, my old desktop was getting so long in the tooth and I hadn't replaced it that the first year that I entered my images into PPA a couple of years ago, I hadn't updated my desktop yet. And the retina screen on my MacBook Pro was so much better, even though it was smaller. I ended up doing all my editing on that MacBook Pro uh, of competition photos, and they turned out pretty good. So it, it can be done. But the the data, last time I read, it's been a number of years, but the data suggests that you're 40% more efficient on a large desktop screen than you are on a mobile device when it comes to editing photos, just because of the screen space and being able to get around and see things without having to zoom in. You can save a lot of time. And when you're doing you know stuff where you're editing a lot of photos and shooting a lot, time is definitely money. Yep. Forty percent. That's huge. That yeah, really is. It's a big yeah. difference. Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, let's. I don't want to make this the all the Apple show, but interestingly enough, we've got these uh, new published patents that show an Apple Watch that might have a camera. Uh, Steve, you're a recent Apple Watch purchaser. Uh, yeah. Um. I do you have that that uh, image? Yeah, I'm pulling that up. I'm pu uh, I, I saw the headline, but I didn't read the article. So here it is. It looks like. He has pulled out or off the band a little flappy bit with oh, a sensor at the end. Yep, he's pulled oh. a little flappy bit out. Oh, I don't geez. know. God, that is. Oh. What, would, mind. what mind. would you call it, Steve? What would you? What do they call it? They call it. Uh, so here's the, if this was like six months ago, I'd say Apple will never do something like that. But given all the, the leaks on the iPhone 11 that's coming out, first of all, I'm keeping my iPhone 10 for yet another year. I, I've always replaced my phone every you know one to two years. I'm gonna have mine for at least three years now because the thing that's coming out, the iPhone 11 is so hideous. Um, but th that's just, that's just, wow. Uh, that's ugly, that's weird. Um, I guess, I guess, though, you know, some people wear a watch on their right hand, some on their left. And so it enables you to kind of set the band where you want it and use it accordingly. But really, do we need a camera on our on our watch anyway? Well, uh, it's it's an excuse to say, look what this model has that you want to upgrade to. And then there's rumors that maybe even a 360 degree camera, which I don't know how I feel. Hmm. Uh, but speaking of 360 cameras, on the road trip this summer, along to document, this is going to be one of the best documented road trips ever. Um, <laughs> and you know what it's going to be? It's going to be 99% grouchy Henry faces. I hope he's not watching. I love you, Henry. Um, this is the Instax One. Is that what it's called? I don't know what it's called. 
is called the stats? No, no, I'm saying Insta 361 X. Insta 361 ah. X. Uh, really impressive quality so far. And it, uh, you know, I haven't shot with a um, 360 camera since Africa, August 2016, I think. Yeah, August 2016. There we are, three years later. Serious, nice improvements, and even more importantly than the improvements in the quality, it's the improvements with how easy it is to share. You open the app, you get the picture, you it just automatically from the phone goes up to Google Photos, where Google Photos completely supports 360. Drag and drop to share to Facebook. Facebook completely supports 360. So that right there, it was kind of a gimmicky sharing system and clunky prior to at least my last experience. So this is a nice upgrade. And this has a couple of really cool features like bullet time where you're just whipping this around your head and then you get this super slow-mo 360 view. So I need to figure out some fun ways to um, to use that. Yeah, so we'll see. So maybe Apple's jumping on this 360 bandwagon and they think they got something good going on here. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Real quick, because I think only Tim and I care about this. Uh, we may have been talking about this earlier today. And since I'm just reporting from a rumor site, I'm allowed to share this. Tamron 17 to 28 FE, this is for Sony, uh, is uh, going to be priced at $899 and pre-orders will start tomorrow. So um, it's just out of reach. I can grab it. My, 17 to 28? Yeah. So what's here. The, what's the F? What's F, the? Constant F28. Oh, that's good. So if you've watched this channel for a while, um, you know I did a review last summer or two summers ago now. I think it was last summer of the Tamron 28 to 75 F28. Uh, this lens is in a lot of ways better than Sony's $2,000 24 to 70 F28. Yeah, it's not 24 to 70. It's 28 to 75, a slightly different range. Yes, there have been a few times where I wished I'd had 24 but it is so affordable, it's so lightweight and so compact and no uh, sacrifices image quality wise. You're just really kind of sacrificing that little bit of range. This is gonna pair really nicely with it. Um, I'm excited. I think I'm just gonna push that pre-order button um, because if it's anything like this lens, it's gonna be a fantastic value. That's awesome. Yeah. Um Hey, I, I don't mean to shift gears. Tom Boggs had asked a question. I don't want it to get lost. We can save it till the end if you want when we do our Q&A. Uh, but mm -hmm. there was no Q, so I just didn't want it to get lost. It's a good question about uh, getting a new screen for your desktop. Yeah, and I think Tim should answer him because Tim and uh, – are we allowed to say what you do, Tim? Tim might work for one of those bigger companies. Um, <laughs> and uh, he has been recently testing a lot of screens and might have some good recommendations for you. But um, what's the, um, what, what, what is the bare minimum? What's that acronym we want? EPS? IPS, an IPS display. IPS um, display. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was gonna tell, tell Tom, like for sure, if you have a, a, a cheap monitor or you're considering an upgrade for a monitor, Chances are, if you've gotten to the point in your editing where you think a monitor might be a, a new monitor might be a good idea, you're probably ready for a new monitor. And I would say, just get the clearest resolution you can afford. You know, 5K, 4K at least, 5K um, is what I've got on my iMac monitor here. It's you know, of course, all built in, but it makes all the difference in the world. When I went from my old iMac desktop to my retina display laptop, it was night and day. There was so much less strain on my eyes. I could see so much clearer on my edits. And uh, as a result, my photos just seemed to be a lot sharper. I could pick out images that, you know, if I'm debating between two images, it's much easier to see which one's a little clearer than the other one and which one you should go forward with on editing. So um, yeah, I would, I would definitely consider new image, uh, image new yeah. monitor, Tom. Yeah. Um, Tim suggests the Dell Ultra Sharp uh, as a good model and also 4K in the IPS. I think I would recommend 4K as well. Uh, you know, it is, gives you that lovely resolution to really be able to see the details. Now, I do caution you, though, if you have an older machine, Lightroom to drive that, you know, full resolution image on a 4K display, you might suffer some slowdown. So that might factor into your purchasing decision as well. 
yeah. or just pick up a 5K iMac. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very nice. Okay. And let's move on. Well, uh, let's see. Tom also asked, where is the road trip headed? So family road trip uh, this summer to Denver, Colorado, or just we're saying Denver, but it's actually Keystone, Colorado, just outside Denver, uh, meeting up with my brother and family there and my mom. And I'm going to have a nice, some, some nice family time before we road trip back. Uh, so and we're doing all the classic like stopping in Yellowstone National Park for a couple of days, stopping in Rocky Mountain National Park and kind of wherever else we want to go. We haven't actually planned all of the return trip yet, which makes me a little nervous because lots of campgrounds are very full. I can't remember if I said this on the show or not, but I went to book for Yellowstone um, a while ago and I was like, oh, yeah, I need I should do this. Then a few weeks later, I went to book, actually book everything inside the the, the um, park was full. I was like, oh no. So I made a reservation just outside the park. Um, oh, two weeks ago, I went back just to check for fun. And there were a few openings here and there. And I canceled my KOA reservation. And actually, did I do that? Shoot, I think I need to call him. <laughs> um, and got our reservations in the park. I would much rather have a bare bones campground that you know bison might wander through as opposed to yeah. Canyon. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm excited about this, but it's going to be fine. It's going to be very well documented. 360 camera. Um, I'm testing out the new little Lumix one inch. It's not that new one inch sensor. Uh, it's kind of uh, Panasonic's uh, competitor to the RX 100 series. Of course, we'll have along. Oh, that's all blurry. I'm sorry. Um, we'll have along um, the Pocket Osmo as well. I've got my drone. Uh, every family member will have their own camera. I think... Um, I think we won't have room for ourselves. <laughs> so we'll see. So we'll see. All right. So Tim says he can't get a site campsite at Rainier this summer. Just keep trying. I think people cancel and they open up, check, check every day. Um, but you know, Rainier is has much fewer campsites than Yellowstone. Yellowstone, some of those campgrounds are ginormous. So all right, let's move on to talk a little bit about other stuff. Um, and I like this article right here. Oh, well, first off, we put this. Let's let's do this one first. Would you spend twenty thousand dollars on a photography gear, a photography degree, or gear? So I haven't read that article. I, I just seen the headline here, but I thought it was an interesting one to include. We had talked about before the show started, and uh, I mean, to me, it, it kind of seems like I know twenty thousand dollars is a lot of money, but to get a degree, it doesn't seem like that much money, especially if you're talking about like a brick and mortar kind of degree, I guess. I mean, the, yeah, there's online degrees all over out there and they're cheap and whatever. Um, but like a really good photography education, uh, I know that the Brooks Institute, um, where I used to live in Santa Barbara, you wanted a degree in photography. That was maybe one year, That <laughs> probably not even one year. It's a four year, program, I believe. So um, I don't know. Yeah. So this is actually a video from Kai. I haven't watched it either, but I, I think this is a, is a great question. And I agree with you, Steve, 20,000 seems pretty cheap for, you know, a, a degree in photography. I think that's not really what you'd end up spending after, after it all said and done. Um, but the, the, there's certainly something to be said for, uh, serious education, however you get it, whether it is uh, a traditional school or whether you enroll in some kind of coursework um, or, uh, or more of like an apprenticeship. But they're really, apprenticeship can be just such a broad category that you need to be careful. You could end up just carrying somebody's lights around for them for a long time and then never giving you any kind of feedback on work. So it needs to be the kind of apprenticeship where you actually get the opportunity uh, at, at, at some point to make something and hear and get some valuable feedback on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just think that any money spent on here is, is going to be better placed than just simply buying gear. I, I think that when you have the fundamentals of photography and you can see light and you can think as a photographer and you, and you really kind of are, are becoming a photography artist you can get your hands on gear. Um, it, it may not be the best gear or you may have to just, you know, work with a budget or, you know, borrow some family stuff or friend stuff or whatever. But 
the knowledge that you have from a photography education and of course that is just you know you have to drill it down to just what kind of education are you actually getting that's far more valuable than any piece of gear in the long run because uh the whole reason we do things like photo enthusiast network and teach on trips and stuff like that isn't to just you know teach you what piece of gear to get or whether your gear is going to work it's really to help you become a better photographer no matter what you use and so i think uh, somebody made the comment i think it was john drummond said i'd, I'd spend it on a bunch of trips and uh, i i like that mentality there john you can you can go on a bunch of trips or one one trip to antarctica um but you know yeah if you have some basic gear you will get an education out there by going on these trips with yeah. some instructors and and i don't know it's it's a difficult question i've actually kind of thought about it in the back of my mind the whole time we've been doing the show because i know we were going to talk about this briefly and um i the more i think about it the more i'd say anything you can invest in that that is really going to help you become a better photographer that isn't simply gear that's that's probably going to be money very well spent yeah. A couple of the comments on that article that are jumping out at me as, as being really smart is that um, to think about the business side of things. If you truly are going into the photography business, don't exclude the idea of going to business school or taking business classes because you have to market yourself. You have to run a business. Yes. There's so much more. And we talk about this a lot in Penn. Yeah. Steve, you wrote this just uh, last the last Two weeks ago, your fantastic Tuesday tip was all about marketing yourself. And yeah. you, know, you know, Steve's Tuesday tip is is not the same as a, as a full blown education, but it's still a fantastic look at the kind of the full picture of what it takes to be a successful photographer. Yeah, and uh, John chimed in again. He said, "I saw Kai's video. Basically, geared appreciates, but not education." So that sentence right there basically sums up everything I just took. You know, two hundred two hundred yeah. minutes to explain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. But let's uh, let's give you all some more education. Uh, I love this five ways to progress in photography. This is also uh, F Stoppers article, and I'm going to share this. Uh, it just spoke to me. I did uh, read through this one before the show, and uh, I, I feel very much in line with what it's suggesting. So uh, first off is um, actually I didn't read number one. Um, Let's see. In my early days of photography, I was acutely aware that photos needed to just uh, that was before YouTube uh, science. So through the resources introduced to the blog, even though I'm RTA. OK, so oh, he's mentioning the Strobus. Yes, uh, the Strobus is a fantastic uh, resource and website. Really nice guy. Uh, I think he, he's out of um, uh, very near where I used to live and grew up in Maryland. Uh, but so. Uh, that's one way finding a resource that speaks to you. Maybe that's photo enthusiast network. Maybe it's something like the strobus, although the strobus is quite specific with working with a lot of light. Number two really spoke to me because it's something that I love that we do here at the photo enthusiast network, either through this, uh, this show or through the Facebook community or the forum. And Wait, that is my, uh, my digi camps website. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, is um, getting your work out there in front of other photographers who know, and then um, you know, getting feedback on that, learning from that. Number three, always be shooting. This yeah. is you know, uh, it's, it, sometimes we caution and and counsel people to put the camera down a little bit on trips and to to take it all in. But those are places and, and events that are just kind of they need to be experienced without the camera in front of your face but as far as growing as a photographer having a camera with you thinking about how you want to capture what you see constantly starts putting your brain into that kind of always on mode where you, you know the kind of framing and the composition becomes second nature to you and i think that's just a fantastic tip Number four is kind of a, a, a being a little bit more focused. So it is, is the early days as a travel photographer. This guy who's writing this article is a generalist. But uh, after spending some time in Brazil and really shooting architecture, they realized that that was their true passion. And they came back and they really became focused on that. And now they're a full time architectural photographer. So uh, it's, it's it's true. You know, what's the uh, 10,000 hours to become an expert in, in something is uh, the generally accepted kind of number that's thrown around. 
Uh, and if you want to be an expert in a subfield of photography, you certainly should be working towards that at all times. And then uh, this book, I haven't read this, uh, titled A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. The book is about the storytelling process. The takeaway for this art author was that they needed to be living an interesting life in, in order to tell interesting stories. Um, mm -hmm. And that impacted their decision-making process. I would ask, will this make for an interesting story? I started throwing myself into all sorts of weird and wonderful situations. I don't know if I feel as strongly about that one. I think um, all of us leave in lead interesting lives and can find imagery in them that is that is interesting so, yeah but um, but some of those certainly uh, stand out more than some others that's cool yeah yeah I want to check out the strobist I I was I wasn't familiar with that uh, he's great great yeah. resource yeah uh, David hobby is his name and okay. uh, he's active on Twitter too I follow him and, and love his posts yeah, you know, one of the things, too, just to give a little plug for uh, a friend of mine that wrote an incredible book, and I've actually seen this book being passed around and, and talked about on pen, um, unrelated to me ever mentioning it. I just happened to know the guy. Uh, he went to college with my sister, and then I got a chance to sit down and hang out with him a couple of times. But uh, his name is Dane Sanders, lives in Southern California, and he wrote a book called Fast Track Photographer. So if you're thinking about starting a photography business, he kind of breaks it down into you can go kind of freelance or you can be your own brand. And um, well, freelance being like you're hired by companies to do what they tell you to do, or you can be your own brand. And, and then it talks about creating a brand. And uh, anyway, it was invaluable to me when I got started. I meant to mention that in the Tuesday tip and I forgot to, uh, but it's fast track photographer. Um, yeah, let me show you guys. There's two books. There's also a uh, kind of a workbook that you can do, but or a business plan. So the original book looks like this. Fast Track Photographer, Dane Sanders. And the business plan is kind of a follow-up, which is this. Um, but a really great guy and super simple, real fast read. And he signed it here. Be you at any cost, Steve. Nice. <laughs> that was good advice, actually. I, um, you know, I was I was a little starstruck, so it was nice to get his uh, the signature on the on the book. But mm -hmm. um, I've um, read that a couple of times, and I highly recommend it to to folks who are trying to become a brand or market themselves or start a business. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Really important. Real quick, jump back. Vince says I think he thinks one of the best things to do is take art and art history class that teach you about color composition then work with your camera gear in specific classes. I think that's a great that's tip as well. That's great advice, Vince. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I also think, I, I know people have started talking about this more and more, but I think that everybody that is interested in photography, at, at some point, carve out time to go shoot film. And I mean mm -hmm. really go shoot film. Like spend a month shooting film or not just, oh, let me try it out for, for a day. Yeah. And, and just because you don't get to see things right on the back of your camera. You, you need to get it right in camera as much as possible. And it'll really help you think through the mechanics of photography and exposure and stuff when you're shooting film and it'll slow you down. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's the, the good points. And uh, you could just tape black paper over the back of your LCD, but it's not the same. <laughs> no. It's not the same. I no, I think you should. I think you should. <laughs> Um, let's uh, move into the last part of the show we call Photos from Space. And uh, we got a couple to pick from here. I think this is neat. Uh, was it two nights ago? Um, SpaceX launched the Falcon Heavy, uh, which is one of their largest rockets. And um, it was captured, the rocket launch was captured from space. So here is, it's actually an infrared view and the heat signature. You can see this white line represents the uh, coast, the east coast of Florida. Here the rocket is coming off of this little heat signature all the way up. So a friend of mine was there for the rocket viewing, not Caleb, uh, somebody else that uh, I've met at a Sony event. He mostly writes about car and um, aeronautical stuff now for Wired Magazine. And he got to see this rocket launch and said it was pretty epic, especially when 
the uh, two boosters came back down and relit because that sound, they were miles away. It took something like, uh, I can't remember, a minute or so for the sound to reach them. Um, but it just sounded like a pretty epic thing. And I would love to see that one day when a, a, a rocket launch in person. Yeah, that would be really cool, especially with those rockets coming back. I just find that totally fascinating. I've, I've seen the slow-mo videos of it and stuff, and I could watch them over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we had the one question that we answered for Tom, so I think we're in pretty good shape, Tom. And if you want actual links, uh, if you, I saw, um, just post in the pen group, and we'll get you some actual links to some of those models that we recommend there as well. Yeah. Well um steve we see each other maybe we'll record at least like a little instagram video to say hi to everybody you are stopping uh, by i'm coming on uh tuesday i'm uh flying out to seattle spending a night at toby and chris's place and then wednesday morning i get up go back to seattle airport and fly to i think i go to uh where do i go seoul i i, I can't remember i'll have to look at my itinerary but ultimately mongolia <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's gonna be awesome. I'm really excited for you guys. I'm interested to see here that how that trip goes because uh, if you don't know, I'm uh, doing a similar Mongolia trip a little bit later this year in the fall. Um, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be you guys are spending most of your time with the Eagle Huntress. Uh, that Netflix documentary is out. Uh, you're gonna actually stay with the family, be there to photograph some of that. It's just gonna be awesome. So yeah, cool. that'll be really cool. And and for those of you, uh, my dad is visiting this week, and he kind of asked me the other day, like, what what is it about Mongolia? Why are why are people going? Like, I don't know anything about it, and it's just south of Russia, next to Kazakhstan, and it's it is an interesting place, but it's really come up as a tourist destination for the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had a real interest in, in seeing Mongolia since 2004. Um, I'm a huge fan of the mini series documentary called Long Way Round. I knew you were gonna say that, yep. yep. Every time I think about Mongolia, I think about them riding a motorcycle across the country and they spent you know quite a few weeks doing it. And I just thought it was fascinating, you know, the culture and the vast landscapes and the, the um, I don't know, the weather and the layout and just, it's going to be a very, very interesting trip. Uh, I'm looking forward to the experience and I have somewhat of an idea of what to expect, but not much. And that's pretty exciting to me. So it should be, it should be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I'm going in September. Uh, Gus, who was in my Lightroom workshop this past weekend, he was there in early October last year and said he froze his butt off. So I may in September being like, I should have gone on the July trip <laughs> because out there in those open plains, I think it gets cold. Very Yeah, cold. We're staying in uh, Gers. They're, yep. they're basically, it's a yurt, but yep. that's their term for it. And, um, yeah, I'm, I haven't, done quite my research on what the weather is supposed to be like and stuff, but it looks, it looks pretty mild this time of year. I, I'm thinking yeah. mid seventies and, yeah. and in the fifties at night or something. Shouldn't be too bad. Yeah. Nice. Sounds, sounds very good. All yeah. right. I think we're going to let these fine folks go. Thanks so much for watching. If you haven't already hit that thumbs up button, that's just an easy way to thank us for our time. And as I said, I think late July, we will be back with this show. As soon as I know, I'll post up a, a video so that you know when it's coming again. And we'll be posting in the pen group. If you're watching this and you're not a pen member, consider joining. There is a fantastic community of folks, all helpful and nice and ready to kind of support you as a photographer in your growth. And if you're talking about building a website, consider Squarespace, photorec.squarespace.com slash photorec TV, and you can save 10% off your first purchase. Maybe in the next week, I'll be able to fully just, just switch the domain. I haven't done that yet because I need all the back end pieces to be completely working uh, with, that, with the minimal breakage. And I'm not quite there yet, but I hope to be soon. So keep an eye out for that. Cool. All right. And you can find both Steve and I on Instagram. Links to our Instagrams are right down below this video. Make sure you follow because we post from time to time on our adventures. Thank you, Steve. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Bye-bye. See ya.